Let's talk about Jesus' childhood in the Quran. Jesus in the Quran? What are you talking about, Ilyan? Muslims believe in Muhammad. They be Elian adalah seorang ateis yang mengambil gelar sarjana dalam bidang sejarah. Selain mempelajari hal mistis, Elian juga mempelajari sejarah agama. Dan ia mampu menceritakan masa kecil Yesus dalam Al-Quran. Sebab di dalam Bible tidak tertulis masa kecil Yesus. Karena menurutnya, masa kecil Yesus itu sangat penting. So remember how the Bible basically tells us nothing about the childhood of Jesus? Except that sometime after he was born and visited by the Magi, Joseph was told by an angel to flee to Egypt with the boy. And then eventually they come back, but there's a new king reigning who they're afraid of, so they don't want to go to Judea, and instead they go to Galilee, and from Galilee they go to Nazareth. And therefore the prophecy is fulfilled that Jesus is called the Nazarene. This is Matthew 2, by the way. And then in Matthew 3, we go straight to the baptism of Jesus, with a teeny little mention of someone named John the Baptist. And just a little side note, John the Baptist is a super interesting character, so let me know in the comments if you want me to make a video about him. But first, let's talk about Jesus' childhood in the Quran. Jesus in the Quran? What are you talking about, Ilyan? Muslims believe in Muhammad. They believe in Jesus too. They don't necessarily believe he was the son of God, but they do believe that he was a very important prophet. And in fact, his journey into prophethood begins as a child, when he starts performing miracles. The first one being the one we talked about where he spoke at birth. But let's talk about a couple other ones and where the Quran potentially got them from. So there are two main ones that I want to talk about, and one of them is in the Quran, and one of them comes to us through a tabari a Muslim scholar. Now the one in the Quran is one where Jesus is given a power that only God had, and that is the power to create life out of clay. So we all know how God made Adam out of clay and then breathed life into him. And that is a quality unique to God in the Bible. But in the Quran, Jesus has that power too. Jesus the child or Isa the messenger of Allah says, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord that I designed for you out of clay a figure like that of a bird. I breathe into it and it becomes a bird. And then he goes on to list the other things that he's going to be able to do, like heal the blind and the leper, and magically know what you're going to eat tomorrow. But here's what's really interesting. The story of Jesus making birds out of clay also exists in the infancy Gospel of Thomas, one of the non-canonical apocrypha, the books that were basically removed by the church for whatever reason. The infancy Gospel says that Jesus makes 12 sparrows out of clay. And one of the children who see him do it go to his dad to tell on him. They go to Joseph like, Mr. Joseph, Jesus is making birds out of clay and that's not allowed. And this was especially sinful because it was the Sabbath. So Joseph goes to Jesus like, Baby Jesus, why are you trying to ruin the Sabbath for everybody? But Jesus, being chill as fuck even as a baby, doesn't answer. He looks at the sparrow and he says, Fly away, little sparrow. Remember me in your life. And as soon as he said that, the birds got up and flew away and Joseph was astonished. What do you think? Why are the childhood miracles removed from the Bible? And why are they included in the Quran? Menurut Elian, dosa warisan dalam Bible sangat tidak masuk akal karena sejak lahir manusia sudah diberi kehendak bebas dan hal ini sejalan dengan apa yang ada di Al-Quran. Do you know how in the Christian Bible the object of divine revelation is basically God himself who we get to meet in the figure of Jesus Christ? It feels kind of contradictory given that God is the all-powerful, all-wise, all-knowing, all-being. Like how are we with our limited mind supposed to know him? If he's able to be human and hung on a cross, I mean, how powerful could he really be? Well, in the Quran, the object of divine revelation isn't God himself, it's his will. Because in Islam, the fact of God's almighty power is very well understood. You can't know God personally, but you can enact his will, essentially by memorizing and reciting Quran. So unlike in Christianity, in Islam, the existence of God is very matter-of-fact. Quran is his untainted, untouched, divine word as revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. And as a Muslim, it isn't your job to know God or to accept Jesus or to find forgiveness and salvation. And your job as a Muslim is to love God and enact his will before anything else. You don't seek forgiveness. Because in Islam, humanity isn't born in sin. 
We aren't plagued by the shame that needs salvation via the Prophet. In Islam, humans are the free agents of the world. We are God's representative on earth. And we have the free will to choose to go with or against God's will. Remember how pressed the angels are about our free will? It's very important. Whether you go to heaven or hell in Islam is based on what you've done throughout your life. Do your acts of goodness and piety outweigh your sinfulness? Whereas in Christianity, we're all born in sin. And it's up to us to find Jesus, get on our knees, and tell him we're sorry. If you can say you're sorry, then you're good. You know, if the Christians are right, then my ex is definitely going to heaven. Man's got so good at apologizing. What's more is that the Quran is not trying to be a historical book. It's more concerned with the morality and spirituality of God's will than it is with historical fact or detail. And above all else, it is poetry. Like the Quran drops bars, okay? In one of its verses, it even refers to its own poetry. Essentially to say that like, Quran slaps so hard nobody but God could have written it. And that's a genuine argument for its authenticity, by the way. Chapter 17, verse 88 of the Quran. Even if humankind joined with the jinn and tried to produce something like this Quran, they couldn't produce anything like it. Not even if they supported each other. Because, you know, the humans and the jinns are odds, obviously. Basically, Quran said, ain't nobody dropping bars like Allah, okay? And that being said, it's really not worth reading in English. If you want to know Quran, you want to read Quran, learn Arabic first. Because it is genuinely the highest of Arabic poetry. And even a basic poem loses its meaning when you translate it. So imagine what happens to God's divine word. Anyway, what do you think? Do you think the difference in the nature of revelation in Bible and Quran is important? What do you think it says about Christianity? That God can so casually be lumped into a triune with a spirit and a man, and at the same time be presented as beyond and above all things, while Allah remains so beyond and so magnificent that all we can do is sense for and embody His will via the metaphorical and lyrical language of poem. And no, I'm not. Elian juga mempelajari dan melakukan riset tentang hari-hari terakhir Yesus dalam pandangan tiga agama yang berbeda. Karena menurutnya hal ini sangat bertolak belakang. Remember Jesus' last words on the cross? Eli, Eli, lama shabaktani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, did you know that those are only his last words according to Matthew and Mark? It's in the book of Luke that he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And his last lines are actually, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then in John, the most interesting account in my opinion. First he says, Woman, behold thy son, and behold thy mother. I thirst. It is finished. Now, if all the disciples were there, why do they have different accounts of what his last words were? Ilyan, why are you so obsessed with Jesus? Are you Christian? No. But I've been obsessed with Jesus since I was a kid. The fact that we measure time according to when someone was here on earth used to boggle me as a kid. And obviously, I needed to find out everything I could about who he was because, like, why is this person so important? But anyway, back to the last words. Now, Christian scholars have pretty much reconciled these into the seven sayings of Christ on the cross. But the fact is that you can't find all seven in one book. The one I didn't mention being Luke 23, 43. Truthfully, I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So different last words, as well as different accounts on who was saved that day. Was it the robber? Was it Barabbas? Was it no one? Now, in the Jewish faith, Jesus is generally considered by scholars to be a false prophet because it's considered that the time of his coming isn't aligned with the prophecies of the true Messiah. And in the Quran, he was never unalived. What? Ilyan, you heretic. No, I'm serious. Now, regardless of your fate, let's just think about this for a second. In the Quran, the unalivement of Jesus is only spoken of in the past tense. And it comes at the end of the chapter, Anisa, the women. Which honestly makes a lot of sense considering that the biblical accounts of the last days of Jesus have a lot of women around him. And it's the women who follow him afterwards to the tomb and the women who are sent to speak to the disciples. Honestly, women are so underplayed in the Bible. But anyway, Quran chapter 4 verse 157. The Jewish people said, We killed the Messiah, Isa, son of Maryam, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. But it appeared like that to them. And those who differ therein, are full of doubts. They have no certain knowledge. They follow nothing but conjecture. For surely, they killed him not. The idea is that it wasn't Jesus himself, but the likeness of him that was put on the cross. And there is 